Hi, I'm Steve Schindler. I'm Katie Wilson Milney. Welcome to the Art Law Podcast, a monthly podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The Art Law Podcast is sponsored by the law firm of Schindler Cohen and Hockman LLP, a premier litigation and art law boutique in New York City. Hi, Katie. How are you? Hi, Steve. I'm good. How are you? You're good. in our brand new podcast studio. Yeah, it's amazing. This is the, almost the end of the seventh season, and we now have a completely refurbished podcast studio with great soundproofing and colors, and I love being here. Yeah, great improvement. All right, well, today we're back to Italy, which is uh, one of the hotbeds of our discussions about cultural property and control of culture. And we've talked about the Getty Bronze, which we'll talk about again on the podcast. So that's great. But we're talking about old works and a new-ish or what we think of as a novel Italian law trying to control their use in some ways. Um, So I think that'll be a new topic for our listeners. It will be. And we'll keep them guessing a little bit. But we are joined today by two Fantastic guests. We know them both really well. Sharon Hecker is an art historian and curator specializing in modern and contemporary Italian art. She received her BA from Yale University and her MA and PhD in art history from UC Berkeley. She is a leading authority on the sculptor Bedardo Rosso and is on the board of directors of the College Art Association, where she serves as liaison to the Professional Practice Committee. Sharon is a member of the Sculpture Vetting Committee at Tefaf Art Fairs and is chair of the International Catalogue Resonate Association and has written numerous books in her field. We are also joined from Milan by Giuseppe Calabi. Giuseppe is a senior partner at CBM and Partners, and after graduating in law at the University of Milan, he earned a Master's of Laws at Harvard University. He has successfully developed the art law practice in which his firm is widely recognized as a leader both nationwide and internationally. He regularly assists Italian and international art market operators, among which are important private collectors, artists, auction houses, dealers, art galleries, artist estates, cultural foundations, and associations. He is also a past chair of the Art Cultural Institutions and Heritage Law Committee of the International Bar Association. So welcome to the podcast, Sharon, and welcome, Giuseppe. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start off. So we're talking about Italy's approach to controlling the use of images otherwise in the public domain, meaning not under copyright. These are ancient works of cultural property. And There have been a couple cases in the news recently, one about the Vitruvian Man and one about David in Venice and Florence, respectively. And the law under which Italian museums are seeking to control commercial uses of those images, again, long in the public domain. So as an American, it's very confusing. I think it's confusing even to other Europeans. So maybe, Giuseppe, we could start with you talking a little bit about that law when it came into effect, what it says and how it's grounded in sort of the Italian constitution or sense of culture and law more broadly. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for having us here. So yes, the law is uh, the first piece of legislation in which the Italian state uh, has uh, asserted uh, its control over reproduction of properties uh, in its collections is a law dated 1939. So this law was enacted in full fascist regime. And the provision here was very limited because it only simply said that it was prohibited to make molds out of uh, three-dimensional artworks. And the main scope of this provision was to protect uh, such artworks against, uh, you know, the risk of being damaged uh, in the making of the molds. So the state uh, said, you cannot make any molds for three-dimensional, for sculptures in public collections unless for particular reason, I allow you to do so. There was no fee that would be requested by that law. So the law was simply aimed at protecting the state, uh, certain artworks uh, in the possession of the state. 
Then uh, the following relevant law provision uh, uh, comes out uh, 60 years later. In 1999, there is a unified text of cultural heritage provisions. And uh, in this text, uh, it is for the first time provided uh, in a very you know, articulated way that not only the state has the right to and the power to authorize the reproduction of whatever artworks are in public collections, but also that a fee according to certain tariffs uh, uh, that were to be defined by the Ministry of Culture were to be paid uh, in case the state did authorize the reproduction, not limited to three-dimensional works, but all types of works. So the scope of this law clearly would shift from the protection of, uh, you know, the integrity of a three-dimensional work uh, to the idea that the state wanted to control reproductions for making money out of the reproductions that uh, could be made so this law was restated five years later with the current cultural heritage code with no much difference. So again, an authorization is required and you have to, in case it is denied, then there's nothing you can do. But if it is granted, then, and you have to seek the authorization before making the reproduction, then you have to pay a fee and the ministry has over the years uh, issued uh, a schedule of fees uh, or a document regulating the fees that uh, are required. Again, there's nothing in this law and in the current cultural heritage code that would imply that the state in giving the authorization would exercise a discretionary power that would get into the merits or the scope of the reproduction. Why do you want to make a reproduction? For what purpose? For advertisement? For any kind of purpose? So, and this is where we stand now. And this law has been interpreted by Italian courts and by the ministry itself uh, as a law that would not only, you know, give the possibility to the state to make money out of the production. And in, in my experience, the state does not make much money out of this provision. I mean, it's very difficult to exercise reproductions, even limited to those that are made in Italy. And then we will go to we'll address the topic of yeah. what happens to the reproduction. Well, let, me, let me ask you just a couple of clarifying points for, you know, non-Italians. So this law applies to any cultural object owned by the state or an instrumentality of the state. And of course, in Italy, like in all to most of Europe, that extends to virtually every important museum because every important museum is owned and run by the state. And so unlike in the US where we have museums that are private institutions, although nonprofits for tax purposes, in Italy, these are all state institutions. And so every masterpiece of Italian culture we can imagine that's on Italian soil would fall under this law. And and if I wanted to, let's say, use an image of, you know, Michelangelo's David, which we'll talk about in a minute, I would have to go to the museum in Florence and say, I'd like to use this on my T-shirt. Please give me permission and I'll pay you a small licensing fee. And they could say yes or they could say no. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And technically the law is limited to commercial purposes, right? And of course, as Steve and I've talked about in many contexts, the line in the art world, right, everything is commercial. So the line between commercial and non-commercial is unclear, I'm sure. But technically, the law doesn't apply to nonprofit educational purposes, right? It applies to commercial reproductions. Yes, correct. That's correct. So the, the requirement of the authorization and uh, the requirement of a fee to be paid uh, for making the reproduction. Yes, this does apply only to commercial uses, but there's no fine line of what, you know, a commercial use. It's not a commercial use. For example, if you want to reproduce a, an artwork uh, at the Uffizi for having it published in a book for a school, that would be considered not educational, but a commercial because the book is being sold to the public. So someone would make money out of it. Right. And Giuseppe, do we know, I mean, this law now has been on the books for 20 years, at least as authorized in 2004. Is there a record anywhere of the sort of the number of applications or the, the types of applications that are granted or not. So we don't really know whether there have been five or 500 or 5,000. 
No, there's no no such a record. And uh, well, first of all, the Italian public administration is far from being transparent, as you would expect. Uh, I don't even know if there is any item in the uh, Ministry of Culture's balance sheet. Uh, maybe there is, but I would have no clue to answer your question. But principally, there is no record. But again, I don't think that the state makes uh, this is not only my opinion, this is a generally you know shared opinion, that the state does not really make money or relevant money out of uh, this authorization that is, you know, discretionally being given. Sharon, let me ask, um, so again, unlike the U.S., Italy has as part of its constitution this idea that it's the responsibility of the state to protect and promote Italian culture. It's like ingrained in the the heart of the purpose of the state in a way that, you know, is not true everywhere else. And And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about why that is the importance and centrality of Italy's old slash ancient cultural objects to its identity today and and how this type of state control of that fits into that? Sure. Um, well, I mean, on one hand, yes, in many of these cases, the artists were Italian and their works were made in Italy. And so there is some kind of connection to the culture. But there's been a long history of promoting Italy to the world as a cultural center. And that's why so many people travel to Italy. And that's why Italy has has this reputation of the great bastion of Renaissance civilization and things like that. That comes from circulating those images around the world. And Italy itself has been a, a very active player in that because it has really worked to create the identity of Italy as that kind of a place. This was also very strategic, especially after World War II, but even during fascism, that Italy should become the center of great cultural production. And a lot of this happened through this circulation of these images. Actually, I was thinking it's interesting, 1939 that Giuseppe mentioned, because that's the year that, for example, the Vitruvian Man became famous because Mussolini created a great exhibition showing the great Leonardo next to the greatest living Italian, which was Benito Mussolini. <laughs> so this has gone hand in, you know, really hand in hand with Italy's attempts to become a strong international power. And it reflects back on Italian culture, the free use of images. I mean, all the books we do as scholars, all the exhibitions we curate on Italian art, that's always reflecting back on the country. Uh, of origin, obviously. But Italy seems to want to exercise, and I think every example you've given is falls into this, that both when it's exporting its culture or it's controlling how it's used without permission, there's a sense that the state can exercise control on Italian culture, which, you know, in the U.S. has never been the case. We're the polar opposite, right? The state has nothing to say about culture. The arts is a critique of the state or, you know, it just it exists in a parallel universe. So, it's unique. And I'm, you know, curious if you think this current law fits into that long history or is it departure in some way? Hmm. I mean, you could take as a counterexample France, which is so eager to share its culture and has right. no sense of wanting to control it. So I think Italy is quite unique in that, you know, the reason impressionism got so big in the, in the world and in the United States was because there was incredible openness to have those works and to have them reproduced and to invite scholars and invite exhibitions. I mean, we're at the hundred years now of all kinds of beginnings of impressionism. And here right. we see shows in, at the Met and all over that really celebrate France and French impressionism around the world. So, yes, it's exactly what you said. I think they really want to have it both ways. They want to control it, but they also want it to circulate. Giuseppe or Sharon, do you have a sense of why this law came into effect at the end of the last century? I mean, what was the need for it? Um, again, this law has not been very much discussed uh, over the years. It apparently became a very popular law only after the Michelangelo cases uh, of a few years ago. So all of a sudden, everybody sort of became aware that, uh, you know, you need to have uh, a permission. And if you don't get the permission, you may run into trouble. So I think it has to do with the control that uh, you, Katie, and, and also Sharon was mentioning before, the control by the state, which uh, mm -hmm. is something that is deeply rooted uh, in Italian uh, cultural heritage provisions. And you know that the first provision dates back to 1909, 
regimes. So it is one of the oldest, uh, at least in Europe. So control by the state, but I would even go further here, because uh, if you can, uh, if you read uh, the recent cases that maybe we will address in a, while, in a little while, yeah through the courts. Uh, the state really intends to do here is to control uh, the use that a certain image uh, is being made by private individuals. It's the power of the state to control the image of uh, works that are in public museums. And this, in my view, gives rise to some serious concerns because uh, as you said, in the US, this would be unconceivable. The state uh, here, I mean, is uh, reminiscent, I think, of uh, uh, what was the old fascist idea of uh, ethical state. The state uh, controls and governs uh, what the people should think and should, um, you know, the, the values that should be followed. And this is something that goes back to the fascism. And it is uh, somehow upsetting that this is something that uh, happens even today, 80 years after the fall of the fascism. So I don't want to make a political statement here, but I think that this is a typical control that uh, is probably rooted back to those years. I don't know if this makes sense to you. You know, it makes sense, and we understand what you're saying. I think it's hard to sort of take on board, you know, given our sort of sensibilities. What you're saying really makes the law in many ways analogous to the um, use of intellectual property, right? Fascism moved very swiftly in Italy into post-war consumerism. And a lot of this has to do, again, with marketing, with the um, fashioning the Italian post-war identity as a country that came up out of the ashes. And a lot of times they say, you know, we need to monetize our culture. And you hear that a lot when you say, you know, I'm a scholar, I can't afford this, or a museum cannot afford 150 image rights from the Italian museums, they say, well, we need we need to monetize. So that is comes out in the post-war period when Italy is desperate to create an image for itself and a financially stable image for itself. And what does it draw on its own culture, which is, you know, legitimate, I guess, in some ways, it's an asset for them. It's interesting, like, is it legitimate as a legal concept <laughs> in conflict with other legal regimes like copyright and unity with the European Union and the global effort to standardize copyright terms and versus is it rational for an Italian museum to want to make some money when its objects are exploited? That's an interesting question. I would say that uh, the issue as to whether this provision uh, would be is in conflict with uh, copyright, even in its European dimension, is a very actual issue. And yeah. uh, I really believe that this issue will be brought uh, to the attention of the European Court of Justice, whether in the pending cases or sometime in the future, because this is not copyright. This is just a right that goes beyond any temporal you know, limit. But uh, the content of this right is very similar to copyright, is the right to authorize and to get money for a certain use except for, you know, the uses that are related to study, research, and uh, free expression, and the like. So, as you understand, these are concepts uh, which are extremely akin to any copyright legislation around the world. But the state could argue that this is not formally defined as a copyright, and therefore we are out of the scope of these laws. But uh, I think that the European court uh, may have a more you know, substantive approach to the issue. Right. And and interestingly, um, when we talk about copyright, we have the concept of fair use, which is the balancing aspect of copyright, which allows new works to be made, you know, to sort of build on old works to the extent that, you know, for a parody, for example. So, and at least one of the cases potentially that we're talking about or will talk about involves a bit of parody. And it seems like there's even less flexibility under the Italian law because the government can just say no, and then it doesn't matter whether it's fair use or not. The only exception is potentially just a nonprofit use. You'd think that also Italian museums are state museums. They have no outside source of funding. They have no boards or donors. They're very poor. 
and they have very little ability to do quality exhibitions and hire curators and things like that. So sometimes, you know, that's the rationale for them is that they need to find sources for income, even if it might be a very small amount. It's something that they are told is to try to use the collection to figure out ways to make money. Right. Steve, that's such a important point, because if we take a step back, right, the very purpose of copyright law is in conflict with this law, right? This law is not a copyright law. It's a different law, but it serves to impede the purpose of copyright, which is to balance this idea of promoting creation with preserving both free speech and the free access and use of information, right? And so copyright tries to balance these two values, what gives a copyright owner, the author, which of course the Italian state is not an author, gives an author a right to control use of their creations for a certain period of time. Now, most commonly 70 years after the author dies, right? So the family or the heirs have some period of time where they control it. But then it's fair game, right? After that period of time, it's in the public domain. In the public domain, the whole concept and idea of that, which I believe is expanded and discussed in the European directives on intellectual property, is that it's very important that at some point, you know, knowledge, information, culture, artistic creation circulates freely, right? That that is also a value that we protect. And that's why copyright terms expire. And this law kind of, for a very powerful actor for the state of Italy, creates an absolute approval process with no timeline, no period of time where it expires. And so that does seem to me incompatible. And and I don't know if there's any sort of idea from politicians or policymakers that this is in conflict, if that's been discussed, or you know how the European court would, would yes. come down on uh, this. This is a, a very important point that you raised. And now, in general terms, uh, the European constitution, the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, uh, the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union, is based on a certain pillars, one of which is free circulation of uh, merchandises. And there is an exception here for uh, cultural property. So, and uh, why am I referring to this? I mean, the reproduction of images is not referred to physical items, but uh, based on this uh, European treaty provision, the Italian state um, opines that cultural heritage laws uh, are an exception to any sort of European uh, provisions. I mean, the protection of cultural heritage comes first. Uh, this is uh, a tenet that is frequently heard uh, or read uh, in uh, the official documents issued by the ministry and also by the courts, I would say. So this law is considered part of the cultural heritage system. And therefore, in particular, in the Vitruvian Man cases, the court has endorsed an interpretation where the Italian cultural heritage law has an extra, a universal application. It's not only related to what happens in the Italian territory, because, you know, there is Article 9 of the Italian Constitution that protects um, the promotion and protection of cultural heritage. But not only that, I mean, this is uh, considered a, a sort of a public order provision that uh, even supersedes European law, which is normally, for a good reason, considered a superior source uh, of law than domestic law. So there is this extraterritorial reach uh, that in these cases, this is a particular application of this principle applied by Italian courts, uh, which even goes beyond this. And then you refer to the Getty Bronze, and that is probably another possible, has nothing to do with the production of images, has to do with something <laughs> else. But, uh, it's another it's podcast. A- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I think. But, but another- the, reach, the reach of the Italian can, state is the theme. Can, right. Yes. We've now mentioned the Vitruvian Man situation several times, so maybe this would be a good opportunity to both talk about the recent case and to take a look at the history of this Vitruvian Man. Sure. So for those of you who don't know the details, um, the Vitruvian Man is this very tiny 35 by 25 centimeter pen and ink drawing on paper by Leonardo da Vinci, probably made around the 1490s, but we don't know. It shows two views of a man. One is enclosed in a circle and the other is in a square and they're superimposed. And all around it is text that's written in Leonardo's notorious backward writing that you could only read if you held a mirror up to it. 
it's a very beautiful drawing. We don't know exactly why he made it. We don't even know exactly when. And today it's in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Venice, but it really wasn't there for many centuries. It's rarely exhibited to the public for conservation reasons because it has to be kept in the dark. And yet we still all seem to know about it intuitively. It wasn't his own idea. It's based on the ideas of an ancient architect, Vitruvius, and that's why it's called the Vitruvian Man. He wrote a treatise called The Ten Books of Architecture, and it's about constructing a house using harmonic human proportions that are mathematical, but at the same time can be seen as divine. So it's a very spiritual drawing as well. And I guess Leonardo didn't request permission from Vitruvius <laughs> while infringing on his copyrights <laughs> very happily. But since it originates in his ideas, the drawing does have importance for Italian culture. And of course, Leonardo, as an Italian artist, even though late in his life, Leonardo died in France. So he wasn't just an Italian artist. And he wasn't also the only one to make a Vitruvian man. Many artists did it. Uh, even Durer made one. But somehow Leonardo's is just more artistic and more beautiful and more human and more mathematically perfect and more spiritual all at once. So that's probably why it's more powerful. And and more Italian, it seems. And more Italian in some ways. <laughs> How long has it been in Venice? So it's actually only been in Venice since the 1800s because it passed from hand to hand, was sold off at an auction, and then it was bought by somebody else who then finally gave it to the academia, in, I think in the 1850s. And for many years, it was completely unknown for many centuries, engraved in a book. And at that time, just artists knew about it because they were using it as a kind of mnemonic device to remember how to make the proportions of human beings. But then in the 20th century, when um, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre in 1911, mm -hmm. famously, that's when Leonardo kind of came to the, in mass culture. And then Mussolini did this big show in 1939, and that's when the Vitruvian Man became known to all. It's funny, it's very recent, but we still know about it so much through memes and paraphernalia, and it's on the one euro coin, you know, it's on every German health insurance card. It was the symbol of NASA's Skylab 3 mission. It really lives wow. in our yes. imaginations, you know, gyms, medical practices, superhero comments, even Bart Simpson is drawn as the Vitruvian man. And also all you have to do is Google and you find t-shirts and watches and pens and cufflinks and posters and flip-flops and face masks and keychains. I mean, it's just endless, as well as contemporary artists. They're very inspired by the Vitruvian man. So it really has its own so, flow into the world. So to some extent, its fame and its importance is derived by the very fact of its reproduction in, in so many different ways. Right. And it's impossible to imagine that all of those uses, Sharon, that you mentioned have been sanctioned by the Italian state or the you know, Italian yes. museum. It's impossible. So it raises the question, which, you know, maybe we'll talk about later. Or we won't have an answer to it. Just how much control does this law even have? Right. You can make a law, but is this the use of the Vitruvian man just so expansive that it doesn't even matter if Italy has a law. It's it's not possible to police all these uses. Yes and no, because publishers don't even want to get started when you say you don't mm. have permission. <laughs> and so that is a problem because even if it's not policed, publishers will refuse to publish things that don't have permissions with them. Tell us about the recent lawsuit about the Vitruvian Man, which is, you know, as Sharon just pointed out, only one of thousands of uses of this object. So, but this is one that came to court in Italy and uh, and then Germany. So, yes, tell us about so it. the case started because a German company called uh, Ravensburger made uh, a puzzle. This company is based in a town, a German town called uh, Ravensburg, which is, uh, it was an important commercial center in the Middle Ages. And uh, there is this important company that specializes in puzzles. Among other things, they are also a publishing company. And uh, they made uh, this puzzle, and this puzzle was marketed in Europe and around the world, also through e-commerce. Then uh, this puzzle came to the attention of the Italian authorities. And apparently, you know, there had been some discussion but the Italian ministry sued uh, in Italy before the court of Venice, uh, the German company. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, they obtained an injunction order prohibiting the German company to distribute the puzzle because it did reproduce an image of the Vitruvian man. There was an issue regarding the jurisdiction and, uh, you know, 
Clearly, one could say, well, but this is a German company. The puzzle was made in Germany. But the, the position of the Italian court was that uh, the, and here again goes back to what um, I had been telling you before, the damage. Uh, so the state claimed a damage. The damage consisted, according to the state, to the banalization of the use of uh, an iconic uh, image for a puzzle. And the damage occurred uh, in Venice because the Galleria dell'Accademia is a Venetian museum. So this would uh, set uh, the legal basis for the Italian jurisdiction. Also, they claimed that the puzzle was, uh, you know, it was possible to buy the puzzle in Italy through e-commerce, which was the case because I myself bought one for my kid. But apart from the technical issues regarding the jurisdiction, whether or not an Italian court would have jurisdiction over something that had entirely happened, at least at the production level in Germany, the other relevant question that was addressed by the state is that we have control, and this control was given to us by the Italian Cultural Heritage Code, which is based on the Italian constitution. And uh, we exercise our control regardless of where the reproduction is made because we can uh, issue an order also against a German company. So this was the first part of the litigation. Uh, the second part of the litigation is that the company filed uh, a claim in Germany before the court of Stuttgart against the Italian ministry. And it was a declaratory judgment aimed at obtaining a, a judgment where the court, the German court would rule that a German company could not be the target of an injunction for something that didn't happen in Italy, but only in Germany. And that was the ruling by the German court. The German court clearly said two things. One, that European copyright provisions could be at stake here. And secondly, that uh, Italian cultural heritage provisions would apply to facts that have occurred in Italy, not abroad. And this is an important principle. So there is a clash between these two judgments. And so we, I guess that this is a typical situation that should be brought before the European yes. Court. Of so That's what I was just going to ask is how does that then happen? I mean, the litigants, the Italian ministry could appeal this judgment to the European court? Yeah, well, the, the thing is this, that according to the European system, you don't have a direct claim, but right. you request the local court uh, to submit the issue as to whether a certain domestic provision, national provision, is consistent with the European law. To, so that there is a control. It's the court uh, that has to submit the issue to the European court uh, in general, with exceptions, but you don't have a direct recourse to the European Court of Justice. So we hope that uh, this matter will be somehow addressed by the European Court. And uh, the cases are still pending, based on my knowledge. So it will, these were an interim cases. Uh, so the, judge, uh, the judgment on the merits is still pending. So can I ask you to just go back one second, Giuseppe, because there are two things that you mentioned that seem slightly in conflict with each other. Or And one is uh, the notion that the Italian government had jurisdiction because of the banalization, I think as you put it, of Italian cultural property. And then the second piece of it is that there are puzzles available on e-commerce in Italy. So there's sort of two things going on here. One is uh, that you've taken an important piece of Italian culture and you've trivialized it, you know, by making a puzzle out of it. But then the second piece of it is that we also have a claim because you're making money. There are two types of damages that seem to be a little bit in tension with each other. Am I understanding this correctly or? Yeah, in a way you're right, because in fact, uh, the state claims damages. And we we will see in the Michelangelo case, uh, the Court of Florence did award the state uh, you know, not, you know, very substantial damages, but damages against uh, the the reproduction of the Michelangelo without uh, the authorization. So, yes, uh, they are, you are making money and the money, we should be the one making money out of the reproduction. Right. So, but I, the I guess the way I see it is you can say, we don't like the way you're treating this image and therefore the natural consequence of that should be, you must stop. Right, because you're concerned about the image. But the second piece of it is, well, okay, you can go ahead and continue 
your banalization of Italian cultural property as long as we get a, a slice of the action. And that's, to me, what I find a little bit inconsistent in the approach. I think that the, the balance, if you read uh, all the judgments, there are not very many judgments. I mean, I must say that there are not more than five judgments, to my knowledge, uh, that have addressed uh, these issues. Uh, uh, so two regarding the Vitruvian men and two on um, three regarding the Michelangelo sculpture in Florence. So the balance between uh, the two aspects that you were mentioning, referring to, uh, Steve, I think that this would weigh in favor of the prohibition. We don't like this uh, and therefore we prohibit you from doing it. We would not have granted the authorization. But since you have done it without the authorization, we pay have us some money. Yeah. yeah. Pay us some money. And again, I, just, I can give you some figures now. The Michelangelo. Would you like me to very briefly talk about the Michelangelo? Yes. I, let's, I do want to talk about the David and maybe we can start again with Sharon just describing the work. I mean, I, I think everyone knows the David, but, knows. but maybe no, people don't know much about it. So if you could give us some brief background. Well, the David, the <laughs> because David. they're already right away after Michelangelo made it, again, infringing on the author of the Bible's copyrights for using the David. It was actually, it was already copied immediately afterwards because it was suffering damage. So there's the one at the Academia. If you've ever been in Florence, there's another David in Piazza Signoria. There's another David at the top of Piazza Michelangelo. There was another David that was given to the Queen, Queen Victoria of England and is in the Victoria and Albert Museum. So that's that question of the copying from the mold. And mm -hmm. um, the original David is really, I mean, that was... It's a hard thing to say. What is the original? I mean, it was so lovingly and religiously copied by people as well because it was considered contact with the original and contact with Michelangelo's greatness to copy him. And then, of course, you get into the 20th century merchandising again, which was entirely created by Italy again. I mean, putting iconic images on their in their popular magazines in the 50s, people came to know about the David. But it, again, it was another work that wasn't so well known artists came to copy it you know rodin henry moore things like that but it wasn't like a mass cultural production until after the war and that's interesting this kind of way that it moved into the mass culture imaginary and especially by you know comedic things and memes i mean if you think about uh, the spoofs on the mona lisa which is in the louvre they're endless. I mean, we have mouse pads, we have tissues, we have, you know, we have everything Mona Lisa, and it doesn't seem to distract from the original, or, you know, be problematic for the original or be problematic for France, right? Although if it was in Italy, maybe the Italian state would maybe, try to monetize maybe. it. Well, well so sorry. Getty scarves of Van Gogh, yeah. and they're stunning, but it's in public domain. So, you know, it's fine. So the David that's in Florence do we know more about when that was created, how it came to be in Florence? Oh, sure. It was made in Florence by Michelangelo. There's a long history of the commission, obviously. It was a work that was, you know, it's considered sort of the, the masterpiece of, of Renaissance art. It was sculpted in marble. It's enormous, around 1501. The idea was, of course, that it is both the ideal of Renaissance male beauty, but also that it was actually commissioned by the guild of the uh, these guilds that were working in the in Florence at the time, and they wanted to put it outside to sort of show the greatness of Florence, right? So it was actually it was carved in marble, and that would be the original work. But of course, to you know, uh, he was very young; he was only twenty five years old. There were all kinds of problems with the marble block, and he knew that this would create a great success for him. So um, he kept going on this work until he was able to create this beautiful image. And then it continued to receive all kinds of different meanings as the governments changed. There was a political symbolism of David, you know, the small mm -hmm. and small versus the large Goliath and what that meant for Florence. And so this went on through history as a, a very um, mythical kind of figure, a political figure, a figure that has a lot of meaning for the city of Florence and for Italy. Right. And, and one difference maybe between between that and, and Vitruvian Man is I think many, many, many people obviously see and have seen the David. You know, I've seen the David multiple times. My kids have seen the David. Whereas we haven't seen the little Vitruvian Man that's sort of locked away, you know, being protected from the light. So the David just, you know, is so much more, um, to me at least, the actual David is experienced by a much greater number of people. 
but maybe Giuseppe, it would be helpful now if you can just tell us what the the recent case about the David is. Yes. Uh, by the way, the David, I think, was uh, re- I think last year or two years ago censored in Florida, I think, by a high school teacher because it was considered inappropriate to be shown. Yeah. Production. Ah, another sur- f- another podcast doesn't surprise <laughs> me in the least. <laughs> no, there are weird things that also happen abroad, but uh, okay. So the yes, case is uh, well they, said. They, yes, I appreciate it. There were two cases here. One uh, was involved uh, involving this uh, uh, company based in Massacarara, which is uh, the capital of of marble, white marble in Italy. And there are quarries from which also the David, uh, you know, the the marble that was used by Michelangelo came from. And this company entered into an agreement with a fashion company, a famous Italian fashion company called Brioni. And uh, they made uh, a replica of uh, the Michelangelo uh, that was used by Brioni to as a you know sort of a model, they would uh, put clothes, a, a black tie a suit on this uh, uh, sculpture, on this replica, and exhibit it. So this was not something that the ministry liked very much, and they said again banalization of the um, image of uh, the David, and therefore you are not uh, allowed to do it. And the defense was well, but the. The marble company said, yes, but we we didn't make the replica just for that case. That was just a commercial use that we are going to stop. But please don't uh, prohibit us from continuing our work. And this was one case. The other case was a, is a case that concerned a publishing company, an American publishing company that has an, a Condé Nast, that has uh, an Italian uh, edition uh, a magazine called GQ, and in this, uh, in, in a number, in an issue of this magazine, Italian magazine, a model was uh, the photographed uh, posing as uh, Michelangelo, and uh, the photograph that was made of this model in this particular pose that was very similar to, you know, it's it's a bi-dimensional picture, of course, was a lenticular, it's called this lenticular uh, model. I think uh, if Sharon may correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a very special technique of making photographs that would, you know, emphasize certain features of the sculpture or, or, or the, you know, the three-dimensional object that it was being photographed. But it, so the result of the output was something that was not really identical. It was a, certainly a variation of the sculpture, the original sculpture. But the ministry here, again, was not happy and uh, issued uh, last year a a judgment uh, prohibiting the publication of this uh, reproduction of the the David and also awarding damages. And the damages were, you know, um, identified uh, in in the following way, 20,000 euros monetary damages because you know, the, the magazine didn't uh, request and obtain uh, an authorization and didn't pay a fee for making this photograph. And 30,000 euros as uh, non-monetary uh, damages because uh, the state claimed that it suffered the, that the image of the David uh, uh, had been impaired by this reproduction. So again, the right and power of the state to control the use of the image and to say what is wrong and what is right. But I, this is what <laughs> I'm telling you about the political view that the state seems to take here that doesn't sound very, you know, gives rise to some concerns. And in, in these two cases, these were both uses in Italy by Italian companies or an Italian branch of a company. So it doesn't raise the jurisdictional questions of the no of the um, Vitruvian man question, but it it does show that Italy, at least on its own soil, is going to please us. I have to read this because this was quoted in an article, the statement from the museum about their legal claim. It says that by insidiously and maliciously juxtaposing the image of Michelangelo's David with that of a model, the publisher, this is a, some of this is quoted, some of this I'm connecting the quotes, was debasing, obfuscating, mortifying, and humiliating the high symbolic and identity value of the work of art and subjugating it for advertising and editorial promotion purposes. 
at the same time, though, I think Stephen's right that that, that um, you know that was a religious symbol that was made for a church, and then it became a major political symbol. So a lot of Florentines do feel very you know proprietary about their David. It's very it's a bit different from the Leonardo. I agree with that. Yeah, nobody takes that was famous David in its away. time. Hmm? Right. Nobody takes the David away from them, uh, so it's still there. It's simply, you know, to say that the state, a public authority, um, uh, has the right to interpret the way a certain work uh, is being reproduced uh, and the, the scope of reproduction. I think this is is no good for me. I mean, it it really infringes upon the you know free expression and all many other principles that as lawyers I think we should all be con concerned right. about. I don't know if you agree with can, me. Can can we just go back for one second, Giuseppe, because I'm not sure I completely understood the process by which this photograph was generated and I either Giuseppe or, or Sharon, because I've seen it and it looks to me like it's the David <laughs> <laughs> a photograph of the David, you know, with the model's head on it. But I'm gathering that there was something slightly more complicated about the production of it. And I'm just curious what it was and whether it matters. I, I think I read uh, the judgment says something about it. I mean, as uh, what I was referring to as uh, a lenticular, I don't know whether this this is a technical term, uh, photograph where, you know, the body of the model, it's, it's the real body of of a real model of a human being that looks like uh, the michael the david michelangelo's uh, david but is not uh, but it looks like and uh, so again uh, here you know it's it's the photograph of not the david you know, but of a human being that looks like the david so it was morphed you know, into more it, right? Here. Because because very few human beings look like the David, and I. But this human I, I, sort of. I does. think it's yeah. <laughs> model was really excited. <laughs> I think, I think it's important though because it's not a photographic reproduction of the actual object, but it's as we said, it's a human being whose image is is maybe uh, manipulated in some fashion in order to more closely resemble the David, and that to me seems a little different it is and so i think it is even more you know the way a court has interpreted italian cultural heritage code here is even you know they i think that they're stretching the law to a very large extent here yeah and to giuseppe's point i mean and sharon your point there's nothing wrong with the museum or anybody in italy saying i find this you know this reference to david offensive or distasteful i mean of course, that's that's modern society. We get to criticize basically whatever we want, uh, or at least we hope so. For the government, for in a government, um, you know, that we think is modern. But the idea that those kind of criticisms can be used as a legal basis right. to stop the use of something is more unusual, and you know, is a kind of control Italy is is exercising over its cultural identity that is impossible in other places. So I just thought that, that this idea of something being an offensive picture or an offensive depiction of an object owned by the Italian state being a basis for saying something's an unlawful activity is uh, is interesting. I don't know, Giuseppe, are there other, I know there have been a few other cases where this law has been applied by Italian courts. Are there Are there any other worth well, the only case I can rem I, I may remember is a case, a very weird case, where actually a court, a Sicilian court, the court of Palermo, did apply the cultural heritage uh, code's provisions uh, on reproduction, although that is not the state. It's the foundation of, um, it's called Teatro Massimo. Teatro Massimo is the most important theater in southern Italy, probably. It's an opera theater in Palermo, very well renowned that is uh, uh, managed and, and possibly owned by this foundation, which is uh, controlled. I've been by... to it. It's beautiful. Yeah. So uh, the image of this theater was uh, uh, reproduced by a local bank for advertisement purposes. Really, I read uh, more than one time the, uh, the judgment by the court of Palermo, and they also said, well, you didn't ask uh, the permission according to the section, the relevant section of the Cultural Heritage uh, Code, and therefore you have to pay us 
damages and that you have to pay the foundation damages. I mean, this is another case where there was, a, it was a simply, you know, there was no idea of banalization or whatever, but it was more a monetary claim here. But I guess that those are the main cases. I mean, I don't think that there have, I, I expect that other cases may arise. It may also depend on uh, the people who are running the ministry. I mean, and of course, there are some that changes when the government uh, changes. And uh, um, so those two cases are probably related, though the cases, the Vitruvian man and the, um, uh, the David cases uh, um, are related to a, you know, I think that the head of the legal department was a person that was very much in favor of, uh, you know, uh, the application of these provisions. Uh, and I don't know what is going to happen in the future, but uh, these are precedents today. I mean, and, and some of them are still pending. So and see are, what the outcome will be. Are there any cases that you're aware of uh, where the court has ruled against the Italian government? Or it all seems to be that the courts line up and back the Italian government's claims. I think so, yes. The Italian courts are on board with this, yeah, it seems like. Do you have a sense, I mean, as, as Sharon pointed out, there are thousands and thousands of uses of both of these works, the David and the Vitruvian Man, all the time. I mean, so the, the ministry, the Italian government, is obviously picking and choosing what it's enforcing, and it's enforcing the law in a very small number of cases. I mean, I'm, we're asking you to speculate, but we do that on the podcast. So would you have any idea why, you know, these two cases and not many others, what's the selection process? I mean, uh, I think that probably these two cases were chosen because, uh, or were initiated by the government because, you know, those are iconic um, artworks, uh, not for any other reason. I believe that the government would not you know, be bothered by uses that uh, would not involve import. I mean, uh, the fact that the two most relevant uh, or the two cases that, you know, came to the public attention are those concerning the Vitruvian Man and the David uh, are already an indication that they're picking up the cases where important uh, works of art are at stake. But they could right. brought they could have brought many other cases about the use many of David. Other, yes. so, that's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And but they don't do it because I don't think they don't have the forces. They don't have the means. They don't have the possibility to enforce these provisions. Okay. Right. Especially but also, control. if I can speculate <laughs> from having no knowledge whatsoever here, it strikes me that we have two defendants here that are going to be newsworthy, right? So if you bring a lawsuit against Condé Nast, that is going to get attention by definition, you know, and, and Ravensburger is a big enough operation that that would get some attention too. But if you brought an action against, you know, uh, Steve Schindler because he made some T-shirts uh, with a photo that he took of the David, nobody's going to care. And so that may be one of the reasons why they chose these cases. By the way, I would like to also point out that two years ago, the state authorized an advertisement campaign that was made by uh, the tourist office, the official public tourist office uh, of Italy. And this uh, campaign involved uh, the use of the Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus uh, and was con normally considered very ugly. I mean, it was a very, you know, I don't know, maybe Sharon can say something yeah, about the it. The cell phone and, you know, <laughs> it was Botticelli's <laughs> Venus, the the birth of Venus, but done up in a sort of modern day tourist kind of to get and the, the, yeah. the, the, the slogan, the main uh, the claim uh, in this advertisement was, uh, how would you translate welcome to Meraviglia? I mean, welcome to, how would you say Underland. that? Underland. <laughs> you know. Yes. So to promote uh, tourism in Italy. Someone may consider this as a banalization of Botticelli's work. I mean... Uh, <laughs> Well, social I, media went at that one really <laughs> ferociously in Italy, so <laughs> they did not I like I do want to ask you, Sharon, you know, before we end, you you alluded earlier to some kind of chilling effect that this law is having on smaller uses. And even though, we, you know, Giuseppe just indicated and we speculated that the Italian state has no enforcement capacity to bring a lawsuit against smaller users of these images and is not, in fact, doing so that nevertheless there are some ramifications of a law like this that are beyond what ends up in court. And so could you talk a little bit about that from your perspective? Sure. I mean, I think it, this 
could backfire because publishers, as I said, do not want to even begin to go down the road of not having permissions with the Italian government, even if there's no chance of getting caught. They just don't want to deal with it. And so publications could really suffer from it. Exhibitions where you have a large number of works and would have to pay a lot of money. Uh, you know, budgets are limited, even for important museums. Um, and I think, you know, Italy's very passionate approach to col col protecting its cultural property could end up being very counterproductive because out of fear of litigation, companies may start reproducing non-Italian works. And uh, this could have the effect of reducing the influence of Italy and its culture globally and um, really damage Italy's standing as a cultural center. Um, and, you know, Italy enjoys a great relevance culturally in the world right now. And the soft power of these visual imagery that is so iconic and has been circulating so freely um, is really what makes it that way. I mean, I think tourism is is a huge Italian business and it comes from these kind of iconic images. So ultimately, I think it would be a great benefit for Italy to continue to disseminate these images internationally. And we have petitioned among the international art historians to change this because it really is out of step with so much that's going on in the world with fair use. Um, but quality commercialization, a kid playing with a puzzle learns about Italy, learns about its culture, learns about Victoria, uh, Vitruvian Man, and it, it, you know, familiarizes all levels of audience with Italian artworks. So it just brings so much of a return to the Italy and its cultural production that it's, it's sad <clears throat> to see that this could backfire and go the other way. Well, maybe that's a good place to leave it. Thank you both. Thank you, uh, Giuseppe. Thank you, Sharon. This was a fascinating discussion. Thank you both. Thank you. Good both. And that's it for today's podcast. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and send us feedback at podcast at schlaw.com. And if you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating. We are also featuring the original music of Chris Thompson. And finally, we want to thank our fabulous producer, Jackie Santos, for making us sound so good. Until next time, I'm Katie Wilson-Milney. And I'm Steve Schindler, bringing you the Art Law Podcast, a podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The information provided in this podcast is not intended to be a source of legal advice. You should not consider the information provided to be an invitation for an attorney-client relationship, should not rely on the information as legal advice for any purpose, and should always seek the legal advice of competent counsel in the relevant jurisdiction.